Okay, well, let me take this off. Uh, so I guess we do have a class. We're starting late, uh, so I'm just going to try and just breeze through this as best I can with what time we have now, okay? So the lesson study today, we're going to start out, let me just start out just briefly with the word of prayer and ask for the Holy Spirit to guide us. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful Sabbath day, Lord. I pray today, Father, for your Holy Spirit's presence to be amongst us and in us, to give us wisdom and understanding of your word this morning, Father, to understand your, your covenant concerning your law this morning, Father, and how the two uh, actually go together, Father. I pray that uh, you will, you will uh, guide us, Father, and uh, that our hearts will be open and our minds will be open and that Christ would be lifted up today, Father, I pray in his name. Amen. Okay, I'm going to start with the memory text. So this week's lesson is covenant law. You know, we've been on this covenant thing through the whole lesson study. The lesson study is a promise, God's everlasting covenant. And today we're looking at how the law plays a role in the covenant. Uh, the memory text is found in Deuteronomy 7, verse 9. And it reads, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is faithful. God, or he is the faithful God, excuse me, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. Uh, which, by the way, part of that is quoted in the Ten Commandments, right? Did you guys recognize that? Deuteronomy 20. It says, uh, to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. That's part of the uh, second commandment, I believe. Um, okay. So, Sabbath after, uh, yes, uh, Sabbath afternoon's lesson study. Uh, I'm going to just read from the text. Uh, it says, one of the most important phrases in Psalms 23 indicates that he leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Uh, David declares in, uh, in verse 3, because of his own moral uprightness, God will never lead us astray. He provides safe paths for us for our spiritual walk through life. Um, what are the safe paths of righteousness? Uh, a writer of another psalm answers this question through a prayer request. Make me go in the path of thy commandments. So there you see a link between the commandments and the path of righteousness. So the commandments and righteousness are linked together there. Uh, it says, all the commandments are righteousness. Psalms 119 one, uh, and 172, God's law is a safe, firm path through the treacherous swamp of human existence. Okay, I'm going to just go right into Sundays. That was Sabbath afternoon. Um, I'm going to start with reading Deuteronomy 7, and maybe it'll give us a little better understanding of what we're looking at here, of where we are uh, as to this study lesson and where we are in the Bible as what to this lesson's talking about. So, if you want to follow me, if you have your Bibles, just follow along, and if you don't, I'm just going to read a little bit of chapter 7, Deuteronomy. When the Lord thy, uh, thy God shall bring thee into, into the land where thou goest to possess it, and has cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the, uh, the, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them. So this covenant thing, he, he's saying a relationship. Remember, what is a covenant? Let's just uh, make clear what the covenant is. There were many covenants. The covenant we're looking at today was the covenant that was made at Mount Sinai. And what was that covenant? Any comments? Okay. Well, part of that covenant, the main part of that covenant is the Ten Commandments. Um, but here God is saying make no covenant with them. In other words, remember what a covenant is. The best and easiest way to explain a covenant, the best example that I always use is a marriage covenant. Uh, covenants, we have covenants today uh, in the form of contracts. 
You know, if somebody buys a home, you're in a covenant. If you buy a car, anything that you purchase or something from somebody else that's an agreement of you to pay or give something back in return is a covenant. In this case, the covenant that, makes, that God makes with Israel. Remember, uh, uh, and they agree. They, uh, he says that they shall be, I, I will be their God and they will be my people. Originally, we started with the Abrahamic covenant. That's where it all started with this. But what we're looking at today is the covenant made at Mount Sinai. So let's see if we can get a little bit more detail as what we're looking at here. Uh, it's a promise. We can look at it as a promise, um, an agreement between two people. And in those agreements, there's often rules that come with those agreements. Think about a marriage. There's a lot of rules that come into a, an agreement when it comes to a marriage, right? We're going to look at some of those in just a moment. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but let me just finish reading from here. So here God is saying before he brings them into the promised land, he's warning them not to make any relationships with the outside nations, these seven nations that he talked about. And remember, they're in the midst of these, these nations. And these nations are not God-fearing nations. You know, they're heathen, idolatrous nations. And so God warns of, of what could happen. He's going to go ahead and, and let us know a little bit more as to the things that might come upon them. He says, neither shall thou make marriages with them. So he's saying, with the, as far as these people go, don't even enter into a marriage with them. Why do you think he says that? When we see the, read the Bible throughout the Bible, we often see that oftentimes what brought the nation of Israel down was entering into relationships with these idolatrous nations. Uh, one of the best ones I can think of right off the top of my head is the story of Balaam. What, remember that he was trying to curse, uh, Balak was trying to, the king was trying to curse the children of Israel, and he kept, uh, he got Balaam to try and curse them, and they, they were unsuccessful. The way that they finally succeeded was they said, well, why don't we bring the women into their camp from these outside nations? And that's what they did. Once they brought the women in, they started mingling with them. Before he knew it, they started worshiping their gods. And then before he knew it, they fell into apostasy. So God... Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, okay, so he says, Don't mar enter into marriage with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shall, uh, uh, shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. There you have it. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. But thus shall ye deal with them. Uh, ye shall destroy their altars, break down their images, and cut down their groves, and burn their graven images with fire. Uh, I'm just going to read to uh, 7 because this is where we're looking at, or 8, excuse me. 6 says, For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God has chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Um, and what we're looking at here before I read 7, verse 7, because that's what the lesson is pointing us to here, is the election of Israel, is to why did God choose Israel? What was the purpose of him choosing Israel? We've talked about this in previous lesson studies. Um, but God says here in 7, he says, The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in numbers than any people. So we didn't choose them because they were bigger and greater as as a people. Now remember the time period that we're looking at here in case we don't really know uh, what we're looking at. Uh, he, says, he says, for you were fewest of all people. So he's saying, I didn't choose you because you were, you know, biggest in numbers. You were actually the, the, the fewest in numbers. Um, not only were they the fewest in numbers, but the lesson study tells us that they were a group of enslaved tribes and politically and militarily weak. Plus, in terms of culture and religion, they were mixed, bland, and without much influence. The basic cause, then, for Israel's election lay in the mystery of God's love and grace. 
okay? So there's no real reason why he chose them other than, let me just read this part here, verse 8. Uh, after he says that you were the fewest of all people, verse 8 says, but because the Lord loved you and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto his fathers. So there's two reasons, but ultimately it was because of God's grace that he chose them and love. That's why he chose them. Um, and it says here in verse 8, as, as I mentioned, I'm going to read it again, but, but because the Lord loved you and because he would keep an oath with, that he had had with, your, with their fathers. Um, so uh, what was the purpose? Why did God choose them? I just... It was the promise to Abraham. It was part of the... Yeah, as it says in verse 8, it says uh, that he would keep an oath which he had sworn unto the fathers. Okay, so that's part of it. But the main reason was, of course, because of just love and grace, okay? And it wasn't because of any other reason. And remember, it says uh, because they were enslaved tribes politically and militarily weak. So when you think of that, what was the time that we're talking about here? Well, remember, we're looking at Deuteronomy, right? It's, it's when he calls them out of Egypt. The covenant that he's making with them was out at Mount Sinai. So this is all taking place in that context. So he says that, you know, he pulled them out when he pulled them out, did they have a military? Yeah, they were, they were weak, small people. And they were not only a small people, they were also a mixed, right, a mixed multitude, which meant that uh, they had people that had come out that were actually not believers of God, of Yahweh. Um, so that's what the mixed multitude was. You know, they served other gods, but yet they came out and followed the children out of Israel, particularly to escape the plagues. So the mixed multitude had come out particularly not for following God, but to escape the plagues. And by the way, Ellen G. White says that every time they had an issue, every single time that they had an issue, it was always the mixed multitude. So when you think about them, when Moses had went up to the mountain and, and he was up there for a while, and they came back down and they had made the, the, the molten calf, right? Who started that? Well, it wasn't, it, it was the mixed multitude that, that was always initiating these things and always complaining and murmuring. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Okay, um, so I'm going to read from the lesson study. It says, at the same time, however, we need to be careful when we look at this idea of election because it is fraught with the potential for theological misunderstanding. And I'll explain what that means in just a second. Uh, what did God choose Israel for? Was it to be redeemed while everyone else was chosen uh, to be rejected and lost or were they chosen to be vehicles who would offer the world what they had been offered how would the following verses help us to understand the answer to these questions so um, let's just take a look at a couple of these verses just briefly Exodus 19 verse 6 if you, if you can turn there just briefly if you have your Bibles and if somebody has it if you would read it for me and if not I will go ahead and read it Exodus 19, verse 6. Purpose. We're looking at, at, at purpose. What really is the purpose that God chose Israel? That you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Okay. So, there's purpose right there, right? He wants a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, which ultimately they did become, right? They did become a nation of priests and a holy nation to some degree. Um, okay. Uh, Isaiah 56, verse 7, I'll go ahead and read that. Even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for just the Israelites, right? No. <laughs> for all people. Which, by the way, uh, this idea of all people goes all the way back to Genesis. It always has been God's plan. Even in the very beginning, God has always meant for his covenants, uh, his gospel, to be for everybody. Uh, of course, it didn't happen until the New Testament, until where they finally had grasped the realization of that. Um, so... Hebrews 2.9, uh, 
Uh, I'm just going to read Hebrews 2, 9. It says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with the glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. And there you have everyone again, right? Everyone's included in this. Um, okay. So I'm, I just kind of like to stick to the lesson study because it just makes it easier for our understanding, especially if you've done the lesson studies, then it's easier to follow, easier to follow along. Uh, as Seventh-day Adventists, we view ourselves as a modern-day counterpart of Israel, called by the Lord not to be the only ones redeemed, but to proclaim the message of redemption to the world in the context of the three angels' message, or excuse me, messages. In short, we believe we have something to say that no one else is saying. So are you guys picking up what's going on here? Back to the question of what the purpose of Israel was. It's the same purpose as it is today, still, for us. And what's our purpose? What is our purpose? What did God call us out of darkness into his marvelous light for? Okay. I'm going to just go ahead and keep, and, and we'll see if the answers will come to us. Uh, I'm just going to go to the bottom of the lesson study for sake of time. Israel was supposed to be the vehicle by which this redemption was to be made known. And our church has been called to do the same thing. So I'm going to read it again. Israel was supposed to be the vehicle by which this redemption was to be made known. What is the everlasting gospel? It's the same as the everlasting covenant, believe it or not. What is the good news? Can anybody tell me in a nutshell what the good news is? I'll tell you what. Why don't we turn to um, 1 John, verse, uh, or excuse me, 4, verse 10. 1 John 4, verse 10. This will give us a better idea of what the good news is or what the gospel is. And if somebody has that, would you read it for me? This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Okay, so that is the good news. That's the gospel message. I'll break it down just a little bit so it's a little bit clearer for us to understand. The good news is that we have redemption salvation through Christ. In other words, you know, Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. We have a death sentence, right? Every one of us does. But the good news is that God has sent his son to atone for our sins. Uh, does yours say propitiation, by the way? Or what does yours say? Uh, that he sent his son to be the atonement. atonement. Okay, so propitiation is what some scriptures say. I like that word better. There's a big difference or there is a difference between uh, um, between propitiation, and if you don't quite fully understand that word, I'll just try and break it down here in a minute. So he said atonement. My Bible says propitiation. So what atonement is, is when you think of how this, this sacrificial system works, because again, this was what God did. When we read that verse, it said that he sent his son to be the propitiation or the atonement, okay? Well, atonement was the temporary covering of sins. It was the way that God had sent, remember, it, it, the sacrificial system through the sanctuary, right? That was a way that they could atone for their sins. You know, it was pointing to somebody who one day would come and do it, not uh, uh, symbolically, but literally, so Jesus is the propitiation, which means he is the literal covering of our sins where the atonement was just like a Band-Aid. It, you know, it just covered the sin. The sin was still there, right? So when you cover your, your, your wound with a Band-Aid, it's still there under the Band-Aid, right? But you don't see it because it's covered, right? Well, Jesus is the one that actually heals and covers that. He is the actual propitiation. Does that make sense? Okay, so um, this was the reason, the purpose that God chose Israel to, to, to bring the good news to the nations, the good news that there is opportunity and redemption through Jesus Christ. 
Um, unfortunately, they, they, they failed at, at, at doing that ultimately at what they had been called to do. Um, any questions so far? I'm going to go to Monday's lesson again. Like I said, we're, we're limited on time. Comments? Go ahead, brother. Well, I think one of the things, God called them to be an example. He called them to show love. And that's the whole thing. First John talks about love and how we should we love our brother and sister. Amen. You know, if you look at the Old Testament at the, the Hebrew prophets, the thing that God comes after them over and over again, not so much that they did it, they were worshiping other gods. I mean, that was a big part of it. It was how they treated each other. Yes. Because yes. the covenant that he made with them was predicated upon love. That's right. And predicated upon how you love each other. The worship of Baal, one of the first things you did was you reinstated slavery. Now, the Jewish tradition had, for your Jubilee, you freed your slaves. Mm -hmm. So you, you, put, you enslaved your own people, you sacrificed your babies, everything else. The reason why God hated the worship of other gods so much is so that covenant law comes down to love and how we show it to other people. Yeah, that, man. That's the love. And so we look at the Israel, the reason why they failed over and over and over again is because they stopped loving each other. That's right. They stopped showing the love that God wanted the other nations to draw to them. And instead it was just the opposite. Yeah, amen. Absolutely right. Um, they, they kept the first part of the Decalogue, which is love for God. You know, this is why Jesus, when, when the Sadducees had, had, you know, they were always trying to trap Jesus, entangle him in, in their theology. Um, you know, they sent the, the, uh, the teacher of the law to go ask Jesus, which is the greatest of the commandments? And, of course, Jesus says, love for God, which they had no problem with that. But the part that they were neglecting was the love for, e for one another. But he said that these are one and the same. Right, that the whole Decalogue or the commandments hinge upon both of these commandments, love for God and love for your fellow man. So yeah, absolutely, brother, that's what they neglected. And this is why Jesus came to show them the, the, the truth about the love of God. Okay, Monday's lesson, ties that bind. Uh, Deuteronomy 4, verse 13, I'm just going to read it. And he declared unto his, unto his covenant, which he commanded you to perform even ten commandments, and he wrote them upon two tables of stone. So, uh, again, I'm just going to read the beginning. However much we have been stressing that the covenant is always a covenant of grace, that it is only the result of God's bestowing unmerited favor to those ent uh, who enter into a saving relationship with him, grace is not a license to disobey. On the contrary, covenant and law belong together. They are, in fact, inseparable. Okay? Now, that's the key to the lesson study here, is that obedience and, and covenant go together. In other words, law and covenant go together. Okay? So obedience, there, there must be obedience to the law. Yes, brother? Time after time, though, we get this all confused. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah. Everything with them was based upon uh, works, basically. You know, uh, we see that a lot in, uh, with, with the writings of Paul, right? In Galatians, um, especially in Romans. Um, yeah, so they had a big problem with understanding that. And a lot of people today... We have a big problem. <laughs> that's right. That's right. We do things thinking that we're going to do God a favor, <laughs> uh, but that's not how it works. Uh, and hopefully if we can get a little bit further, we'll cover a little bit more of that. Um, so here's the thing. Um, when you think about a covenant uh, and obedience is what we're talking about here, or stipulations or circumstances or laws that come along with a covenant, because there is no such thing as a covenant that does not have any laws or regulations that go with it. As I mentioned before, you know, if you enter into a a covenant, you know, or a contract buying a home. There's rules, right? If you break those rules, what happens? Or with anything that you enter in, you know, we have covenants, we buy cars. Uh, when we go to the grocery store, 
you know, buying groceries, believe it or not, you know, there's rules. And you can't just take the food and walk out the door. So uh, let me just read here because uh, this, will, this will give a lot of explanation, explanation a little easier. It says, uh, so when you think about a covenant, the concept of law as an integral part makes sense. If we understand the covenant is other, uh, among other things as a relationship, then some sort of rules and boundaries need to be drawn. How long would a marriage or a friendship or business partnership last if there were no boundaries? Think about a marriage, right? Again, there's, uh, let me just read on. It says, uh, the husband decides to take a girlfriend or a friend decides to help himself to another, to uh, the other's wallet or a business partner without telling the other invites another person to join their venture. Uh, yeah, those, those don't sound too good, right? I mean, especially the marriage thing, you know. Uh, nobody wants to uh, have a husband that says, hey, I want to ha have a girl girlfriend. Is that okay? <laughs> Absolutely not, right? So there are rules to every covenant. Um, so uh, these acts would be a violation of rules, laws, and principles. How long would these relationships last under such lawless circumstances? That is why there has to be boundaries lines to be drawn and established. Only through these can the relationship be maintained. So we have to maintain a relationship with God. And the only way we can maintain that relationship is by abiding in His law. Um, what is the thing about His law? Let me just say this, you know, uh, you mentioned earlier uh, we were talking about uh, other nations um, and, and their gods and, and God warning us about their gods. You know, God says that if you follow these nations and their teachings and you follow their gods, that you become like their gods. Okay? And this is why God has such a problem with this. And this is why God says that he's a jealous God. Not because he's a God that is selfish, but because he has so much love for us that he wants us to reflect his character. Because when you, when you see these other gods... They aren't good gods. They're selfish, angry, vengeful, you know, all of these things that aren't good. But our God is good, right? And so God wants us to reflect his character is what he's ultimately trying to do. And what is God's character? What is God's will? It's the same thing. God's will is his character, which is, just so happens to be, his law, right? The Ten Commandments is not just arbitrary laws, but it's a reflection of God's character and who he is. And he wants us to be like him. This is why he gives us this law. This is why he wants us to be obedient. Because if we can reflect his character, then we're going to have all these good character traits, right? Being like God, we're not going to be like the heathen gods or the idolatrous gods. Uh, let me just finish reading here at the bottom. Uh, it says, uh, the word covenant evidently the words of this covenant in Jeremiah 11, 3 and 6, through, and 6 and 8 are the words of God's law, statute, testimonies, and commandments. So anytime you, you hear those words, you know, which they, they are all the same thing, testimonies, commandments, statutes, all these words that we hear, they, they all mean the same thing. Um, the covenant of God with his people, Israel contained various requirements that would be crucial for maintaining the special relationship he sought with his people. Um, so, in other words, if God has a certain character and criteria, he wants us to be, in order to be in that covenant relationship, it has to be a mutual thing. We have to be the same as God, in other words as far as his character goes. Otherwise, think about it. How can you really have a relationship? Are you really going to agree? Back to the thing, well, if a husband says, well, I want to take a girlfriend. Well, that's not the same character and ideas that the wife has, is it? It's different. So therefore, it's going to create problems. So God says, no, I want your character to be like mine so that we can be of one mind and one understanding that we might be able to keep this covenant agreement because otherwise, without it, they're not going to be able to keep, we're not going to be able to keep that covenant with God. Um, 
Okay, Tuesday's lesson, Law Within the Covenant. Is there any questions so far? Okay, I'm going to just read the bottom of Mondays just briefly because uh, we're running out of time <laughs> anyway. Think of someone you have a close relationship with now and imagine what would happen if that relation, to that relationship if you didn't feel bound by any rules or norms. So think about a relationship if there was no rules, right? Well, basically we can go into a relationship do whatever we want. Uh, but you believed you had, a to you had total freedom to do whatever you wanted. Which, by the way, uh, you know, when we go to Wednesday, or excuse me, uh, Friday's lesson, it says, if. You know, God makes it clear that he gives us a choice. That's why he says if, right? If, meaning that we still have a free will. We have the, the, the choice to either choose God and his ways or not, right? And hopefully we would choose his ways because his ways are good. Uh, law within the covenant. Let's see if we can cover this just briefly. Um, okay, so when you think of the word Torah, 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 uh, it's translated as law, right? We know the first five books are called the Torah, and we, they're often called the law. Uh, it actually comes from a, a word, hora, which means to point out, to point out. But the word Torah also means teaching or instruction. So think of law, Ten Commandments, and rather than looking at them as something, you know, when we think of law, normally at the beginning of the lesson study, it tells us, what are your first thoughts when you think of law? Do you think of police officers? Do you think of traffic signs? Do you think of things that are restrictions or punishment? Is that what you usually think of when you think of law? Right? I mean, I know I do. When I think of law, I automatically think the system, right, that we're under. Um, but in this case, it, the, the, the word Torah it, it means teaching or instruction. So if we were to look at God's Ten Commandments rather than these arbitrary laws and look at them in a different way as to teaching and instruction on how to live, it, it, there's a big difference there. Um, the term can be used to refer to God's instruction, whether moral, civil, social, or religious. Uh, wise counsel. Um, how about that? Wise counsel, yeah. God has graciously given his people so they may experience an abundant life, both physically and spiritually. This is what the commandments are for, you know? So we often look at him as restrictions and things and when it comes to law, but we need to look at him in a different light as to what they truly are. Again, remember, it's God's character is what these laws are. Um, as we read the law, the Torah, the instructions and teachings recorded in the book of Moses that became a part of Israel's covenant, we are impressed with the wide range of instruction. The law touches upon every part of Israel's lifestyle, agriculture, civil, government, social, relationship, and worship. Um, okay. Let's take another look at Deuteronomy. If we can go to Deuteronomy 10, particularly verse 13. So the question is, in what ways were these instructions for their good? If somebody can read that for me, uh, feel free. And if not, I'll read it. I wish we had time to cover more scriptures, but we don't, um, unfortunately. Uh, OK, so Deuteronomy 10, verse 13. Somebody have it? Okay, so he says it's for your good, right? For your own good. That's why he's given them to us. Um, the law within the covenant was to provide guidelines to the new life of the human covenant partner. So did you catch that? The work of the law within the covenant is to provide guidelines, right? To the new life that God wants us to have. Uh, the part played by the law within the living reality of the covenant relationship showed that Israel could not follow the ways of other nations. They could not live by natural law, human needs, desires, or even social, political, and economic 
necessities alone. They could continue as God's holy nation, priestly kingdom, as a special treasure, only through uncompromising obedience to the revealed will of the covenant-making God in all areas of life. So, what we're looking at today in this lesson study, in short, is that in order to have and keep within the covenant, there has to be obedience. We can't just have a covenant and expect God to do everything for us without us doing our part. And our part is to keep his commandments, right? And why do we keep his commandments? Is it for, for, for saving us from sin? Is that what the commandments do? No? What do you think? You're shaking your head no, so... Okay, <laughs> I don't mean to put you on the spot. Um, absolutely not. Uh, the law doesn't do, do that for us. Um, let me just read a little bit from, from my lesson here. Uh, so we know it's to teach and to instruct. It reveals the will of God, his ordinance, testimony, statutes. Um, I'm going to read here. It says, we should ever be mindful that the fact that our need of God's law is like or linked to the lawless condition of the human psyche and not simply our need to rectify sinful actions. Okay, so if you didn't catch it, I'll break it down. It said that it's not, the law is not linked to the lawless condition of the human psyche. In other words, that, that it shows us what sin is, but that's not really what it is. It's not really just to rectify sinful actions. The law is bigger than that. It's greater than that. Remember, it's a reflection of God's character that he's trying to mold us into that we will be like him. And why does he want us to be like him? Again, the good news, the gospel. If we can be like him in his ways and his character, then we can be a reflection to everybody else around us and we can go out to do the will of God. But it has to first start with love. It has to start with love because without love, it, it tells us, the Bible tells us that we're not going to be able to do this. There has to be first love in our hearts in order to be able to keep God's commandments. We can't just keep God's commandments without having love in our hearts. Back to the, the question he asked about what's the greatest commandment? Love God and love fellow man. I'm going to have to end on that note. Let me just read the summary here, and hopefully because we didn't get to cover all of it. So, God's law was an integral part of the covenant Okay, did you hear that? They go together. The covenant has to be, there has to be law within the covenant. Uh, yes, it was a covenant, a true covenant of grace. Grace, however, never nullifies the need for law. So in other words, just because it's given to us out of grace and love, it doesn't mean that there's no law. You know, some people, and the reason it's saying that is because a lot of people believe that, hey, I'm no under law, I'm no longer under law, I'm under grace, right? And really, what does that mean when you ask somebody, well, what does that mean? Does that mean that you can go ahead and you don't have to keep the commandments anymore? <laughs> okay, so on the contrary, law is a means by which grace is manifested and expressed in the lives of those who receive grace, okay? So I hope you guys are understanding. If not, just go back and look at the summary and try and understand exactly what it's saying. So I'm going to end on that note because uh, I didn't hear a second bell, but I know it's, it's time for the second bell. Let me just end with a word of prayer. Wonderful Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so grateful for this Sabbath day. We're so grateful for the opportunities that we can come and gather in your name and study your word, Father. I pray that today, once again, Father, because of the sake of time that we've, we've had, that we would go back and we would look at this lesson study again, Father, and the importance of law and covenant, how they relate, and your grace, Father, and, and, and why you've given it to us, Father, that we might have a deeper understanding truly of what this is that we're looking at today. Father, bless us today as we go out into the regular church services. Bless our speakers, Father, I pray, and be with us the rest of this Sabbath day, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.